Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Robot Wars History Podcast, part two, in this case, of our Series 3 overview. We know uh, from the last episode that we've had a lot of content already, and today we will go further into the realms of Series 3 and all of the information that you may, may not know, and most definitely will not know in some areas. And with me again to cover this will be Space Maniac from the Robot Wars Wiki. Thank you very much for letting me join this podcast again, Nick. And yes, he is right, there is a ton of more information we've still got to go across, including the various organisational issues not related to health and safety that plagued recording of the show, to a number of controversial battles, some of which you'll probably know from the top of your head, and also what actually happened after Series 3 that ultimately made Robot Wars a safer show, and also one that ultimately was more professional in all areas. Yeah, so as we saw in the last episode, it's uh, going to be quite a bit of content to get through, but we've got all the depth we need here. And uh, as we say, we're more going to be focusing uh, partly towards the battles as well today. So I know people in the comments will certainly have their opinions on those and we'll see if we can add any more depth to uh, some of the more notable Series 3 incidents from those things. But anyway, I will let Space take it wherever he wants here with the opening topic of Part 2 of this podcast. Rightio then. So, as I mentioned earlier, there were a number of organisational flaws that plagued recording of the show. And it's not just the health and safety flaws, it was just how the, organi- how the event was handled in general. So, in back in 2019, Pete Collier, in a Facebook Messenger exchange I mentioned in the last episode, was notably critical of the way filming was handled. And he notices that nobody understood what was to occur until the last minute, essentially. So, for example... We should mention the fact that Razor and Velociripper somehow switch side events. And we should also mention the fact that Miss Struts was taken out of these side events in general and just placed in one mere walker battle. But I could go on and on about these organisational issues, but there is actually one quote in, on Tim Webb de- from the Peter Duncanson of Agent Orange that perfectly sums up the faults of many roboteers that were dissatisfied throughout filming. He claims, and I quote, Well, the filming of Robot Wars 3 was a bit of a balls up. Everyone was herded around like cattle, ill-informed, were made to feel unimportant in every way. Then the accident occurred, and things got worse. People were messed about, set home, called back again, told to hang around, told not to, promised hotels yet not might have not might not have got them, or they were over an hour and a half away from the studio. Still not told anything, events were dropped, etc. So my point was I wonder how the show will pan out with the limited footage they got and if the hurriedness of it all would come over on screen. That's why some of us, those with their that were there anyway, have a few biting remarks about the show. Yes, even after just one show. Unlike those that were not there, we have a unique view of the shooting. And I think, in general, that sums up many of the organisational flaws that took place throughout filming, essentially. Yeah, I mean, obviously, once um, some of the more notable uh, incidents happened that were mentioned in the last episode, it, it would have naturally become something you wouldn't prepare for, necessarily, and it could become messy, but... From um, the sounds of the quote there, there seemed to be a certain lack of um, true care from the very start of filming, or a certain hurriedness at the very least. Well, actually, the whole lack of treatment towards these roboteers started before filming, because there was a tinweb post detailing the fact that there was going to be a second round of auditions, and that filming would take place sometime in October which, in fact, as I think some of you might know as well, caused a ton of havoc to the way roboteers could schedule their battles. So, 
you might want to understand why was it that Ultor withdrew following the heat final and why was it that Derek Rose decided he had to go to America at the time? Well, it was because originally the show was set to take be filmed around July period. This was according to members of the Orax Revenge team who were given a verbal assurance by Mary Jane Evans that filming would be contained within July. So the fact that it was meant to be in October already caused havoc to many of the schedules that Roboteers had outside of Robot Combat. And there are two notable examples. As said, the reason why Ultor had to withdraw from Series 3 was not because they felt that Big Brother had won the fight. Well, maybe they did, but more due to the fact that they couldn't actually attend filming for the semi-finals. Additionally... Yeah, I, they just flat out did not even expect to get to the stage they did, so... This also was the reason for why Derek Rose had to go to America for, I believe, a business trip. And because of his absence, believe it or not, Hypnodisc almost had to withdraw from the semi-finals because Hypnodisc was in a right state following its win over Berserk 2. And as a result, it took nearly four hours for the machine to be repaired, and the machine, as a result, barely managed to even compete in the semi-finals at all. So the fact that Derek Rose had to leave almost meant that we lost Hypnodisc before we got to see its fights over against such machines as 101, Stegosaurus, and Chaos 2. And that would have certainly have impacted the remainder of Series 3, and possibly for the worst as a result. Yeah, I mean, it's certainly um, already notable to a degree that even though a machine as low-key as Altor had to um, go home, but it, it just shows that there's so much that uh, often can take um, in order to repair a machine, and as you say, yeah. even, even somebody having to not be there for a small amount of time is is a bad thing. But here, obviously, one team member just having to flat out drop out halfway through the tournament is uh, very notable. And really, Hypnodisc never quite got back to the same form afterwards in Series 3. Yeah. Quite frankly, it was on borrowed time in virtually every single fight after its win over Evil Weevil. Yeah. So, so we got very lucky we got to see Hypnodisc as much as we did in Series 3. So, yeah, I guess, I guess we have to be grateful for what we did get in the end, even if it yes. was a rather limping Hypnodisc, but the team certainly uh, put in an effort with uh, the difficult circumstances they were put in. Yep. And... That as a result of the organisational issues that did take place throughout filming, we also lost one other machine that, well, we didn't actually get to see much at all, whether that or not it would be positive for the series or not. We should talk about Undertaker. So Undertaker, for those we want to know, is the sequel to Havoc, a Series 2 Heat finalist. As said, their battle against Panzer was unremarkable. It seemed that Undertaker was barely moving for the most part. Panzer won via judge's decision. The reason for why Undertaker was in such a state, however, has actually been explained on the website of the team's sequel machine called Cannibal, which failed to qualify for Series 4. They mentioned that because of the safety issues that had occurred through filming, a ton of havoc occurred where eventually they were unable to actually properly switch on the machine. As a result, a very poorly functional machine against one that is competent like Panzer ultimately ended the team's hopes before they even started. And it does make me wonder, I don't actually have a source for this, but it does make me wonder whether Max Damage and a few other machines such as Vector and maybe Bulldog Breed might have suffered the same fate as a result. I mean, with Vector and Bulldog Breed, of course we've got the issue of the fact that they both seem to be having reliability issues. But with Max Damage, it should be noted that its failsafe was not actually inserted. So... Could they have been affected the same way as Undertaker was? We don't know, but it is 
interesting to speculate. Yeah, it is, and uh, as as you, as you just brought it up, I was about to say myself that yeah, there were quite a few notable occurrences of not even a machine breaking down as such, but just not working or moving or being crippled from the very off. I mean, there's even yeah. more of, of, of... I mean, sometimes machines just flat out are going to have issues, but Series 3 especially seem to have those starting position issues for um, some incidents. Absolutely. Plunderstorm, for example. I think it's Storm. Yeah, Plunderstorm. Yeah. Hammertron barely moved. You had... Yeah. Uh, who else was there that was notable? Uh, well, even Ming barely moved, so and that's yeah, ignoring and the very obvious ones as well. The breed, as I mentioned before, yeah. So yeah, yeah. and as I said, it might have been because of the um, organizational issues. It might have been because of the radio death line that I mentioned in part yeah. one that might have also played an issue with some of the battles as well. I said again, I can't confirm or anything, but there were definitely some robots that just suddenly stopped working altogether for a seemingly no reason. I mean, we've got Overkill, for example, Hardvark just stopped moving altogether. So, yes, it does seem to me that organisational issues plus the radio issues definitely compromised a large majority of battles that took place throughout the, sh the series. Yeah, it's definitely fair to say, and obviously, in a uh, robot combat show, it's not exactly idea ideal if your combat robot doesn't always function, even in the most minimal uh, expected ways. <laughs> like, we're not yeah. asking for everybody to be hypnodisc here, but some machines just flat out struggle to do the fundamentals, sadly. Yeah, compare it to a series later, where virtually every machine seemed to function at least competently. Sure, some might have broke down under mild pressure, but they all moved sufficiently. I said, just seeing some robots just fail to move altogether was a bit sad, to say the least. Yeah, for sure. You do wonder how um, certain machines could have performed otherwise, but we will never know in that regard. But nonetheless, we should remain neutral. Not all roboteers were that critical towards filming. I mean, I think I mentioned this before in the previous episode. Yeah, Alex Mordew of Team Firestorm stated that considering all the various accidents that occurred, the crew did the best they could in these difficult times. And Midian Bugs Martin Dawson mentioned that although he stated that he enjoyed filming for Series 2 more because it was filmed at the Docklands rather than Elstree Studios, the Roboteers were not mistreated, he claims that the rules were rules, and that it at least ensured that some organisation and safety were, were present at the filming. And in a true case of the stiff upper lip, we should also talk about King Buxton Simon Harrison during one of his Tin Web posts, stating that, sure, organisation was problematic, but being able to watch the machines perform much later on TV would be worth it. Because, as said, many robots would just go back to building a new robot for the next series, no matter the hassle they experienced during filming. Yeah. So, as said, yes, there may have been some critics such as Peter Duncanson and Pete Collier, but ultimately, not everyone was critical of organisation. Yeah, and that's a, an important thing to point out. Obviously, it's going to change depending on people, and in some instances... It is going to be to an extent which is completely troublesome, but as you say, some people just have a certain amount of uh, stuff that affects them and that might make their experience overall more negative, or some people might not be affected that much or might not uh, personally feel that affected by it in general, so we're not going to act like it's a pure witch hunt here. There were some people who did just try and accept what they had with them or just flat out as you say, just took it as part of the parcel with filming a TV show, essentially, so... Yeah, and let's face it, there's always going to be problems during filming. I mean, even in the reboot, you had some machines that were actually taken out of uh, the schedule because they just 
couldn't move when they were asked to, for example. Yeah. So yes, issues are always going to happen, and it should be noted that Roboteers and the production crew, they're all humans, they're all bound to make mistakes at some point. It's just that, sadly, that there were just a n- huge number of flaws that occurred during filming of Series 3 that ultimately generated the grumbles of many of a roboteer, and which led to the quote of the fact that the BBC and the mentor could not organise a piss-up in a brewery. So, <laughs> yes, yeah, so I have to mention that again, but yes, so, as I said, we're trying to document this as neutrally as possible, so it is worth at least pointing out that, yes, Organisation may have been criticised by some, but it was deemed acceptable by others. Absolutely. Yeah. So, shall we move on then to perhaps the most notable aspect of Series 3, the battles. And boy, did we have a lot of controversy surrounding the battles for this series. So, let's begin with the overuse of the house robots. I'll be honest, when the reboot was took place, I was a little bit critical of the time when the fact that the robot the house robots were very rarely used for the most part. I mean sure they did attack at times when a machine went into the corner patrol zone, but very rarely did they add the finishing touches to a magnificent battle. Perhaps some tin web posts as well as an excerpt from the book Gearhead's Determinant Wise of robotics can help explain why the house robots were so rarely used in the reboot because quite frankly sometimes and not just in series 3 but throughout all of the classic series indeed the house robots had caused significant very costly damage that was time consuming to repair one of the most vocal critics of the house robots during the classic series was Rex Goward he said that yes he'd be perfectly happy for a competitor to destroy his machines because no harm no foul but he would be downright pissed off had the house robots did claiming they were like a mini digger disguised as a robot weighing over half a ton believing it was clearly unfair according to gearheads the turbulent rise of robotics none other this fact was this quote is actually reflected in one of the battles that took place during Series 3, Chaos 2 versus the Big Cheese. So, in general, the battle was quite a clean one. Chaos 2 won fair and square, and the house robots did their party piece of, well, attacking the loser. Unfortunately, things started to go a bit out of hand, because according to Roger Plant of the Big Cheese, he stated that as a result of the damage being inflicted onto his machine, most notably Sir Killalot, it resulted in time-consuming and very costly damage to repair. Well, actually, it resulted in highly expensive damage that was time-consuming to repair. As a result of this, he mentions in a Timweb post that he was considering quitting the show. And it also led to the development of the sequel to The Big Cheese, which we'll discuss in a bit more detail later on. So yes, the house robots were no doubt a pest in Series 3, to the point where it was definitely argued that they were causing far, far too much damage at the point. I mean, just look at the... uh, as, As Roger Plant himself mentions there, it's not always just uh money that gets wasted but these people have to use up their own time in between series to make repairs and then if they'd want to make upgrades but they might not be able to do upgrades if they're spending most of the time repairing the machine so it all adds on top of the uh problem shall we say for them in general if uh it goes overboard which roger evidently thought it did yeah I'm just thinking, imagine if the house robots were just as active as they were in the classic series, you know, the reboot series. So, as I said, back in the classic series, there were certainly many robots that were like a few hundred pounds at most. I mean, some were thousands of pounds. Some were valued at a couple of thousands, but in the reboot series, at least Nuts was the cheapest in series 8. 
and that was like £1,500 if memory serves me right. So if that was the cheapest, then imagine the horror and anger for the house robots to cause as much damage as they did in, say, Series 3. And if the Series 3 competitors were unhappy, then by God, I'm glad that the house robots were not as active as they were in the reboot. Yeah, yeah. Thankfully, when we got to the uh, reboot, there was that emphasis on uh, more of a competitive uh, television show rather than purely spectacle. So that kind of worked out in uh, some roboteers' favour that the house robots wouldn't be exactly as barbaric as they had been in the past because the of the producers and such would have hoped that uh, the robots themselves would have always been able to put on a performance whereas I think sometimes in the classic series they felt like they had to try and liven up certain stages of battles because they didn't always necessarily believe in the competing machines but that's a uh, <laughs> that's another layer to the thing where roboteers obviously don't want too much damage but would understand a certain amount of spectacle whereas the producers would want the spectacle but there's always that line isn't there so yeah oh absolutely so it's as a said, hard balance sometimes yeah as said as kids i think a lot of the kids loved it when the house robots caused an extensive amount of damage i mean just seeing for example bumblebot's axe being cut off for example that just sounds so cool to see yeah. that just looks so cool to see but yes, imagine all the time and expense taken to repair the axe, for example. I mean, the Bumblebot team might have been perfectly happy for their machine to be destroyed in that way, but again, as you mentioned quite rightly, it's it's really something that I wasn't going to discuss in this podcast, but it does bring me to an important point, actually, because... During my read of Gearhead's The Turbulent Ways of Robotic Sports, there was actually a mention of the fact that the Extreme Warriors, you know, the American machines that competed in the their US, the US spin-off of Robot Wars, actually received $2,000 for competing. This, was a, this brings up an interesting point, because for the most part, it is argued that perhaps the whole issue surrounding the house robots causing tons and tons of damage could have been avoided had the producers perhaps say paid the competitors a decent amount of money you know doesn't have to be much you know say 500 maybe a thousand pounds at most would have been nice to help them repair the sh the machines so I said, at least they learnt their lesson, the producers, when it came to Extreme Warriors. So, yeah, <laughs> essentially. Again, it's kind of like, um, like we discussed in the last episode. It, it, the show was sometimes a bit too archaic in its methods in the opening wars, and then slowly and slowly over time, the philosophy slowly started to change towards a more say balanced fair playing ground but yeah it's uh there's it's definitely a reason for where yeah yeah there's definitely a reason for that as we'll talk about later on but for now let's talk about another controversial battle this time pitting exterminator against hefty now to be fair this was again a clean outcome. Exterminator overturned Hefty with its axe. And yeah, that's actually a very impressive attack. What some of you might not realise is that, really, had Exterminator lifted Hefty as it was designed to be, the battle should have continued onwards. But we should discuss the sad story of Hefty during filming. So, before they were able to compete, the team was forced to remove Hefty's self-fighting mechanism to ensure their machine met the weight limit, which, as we know, cost them against Exterminator. However, according to Hefty's Darren Brown in an interview for Gearheads, many robots were suspiciously over the weight limit at the time, 
yet the producers did nothing to force the teams, their teams to reduce the robot's weight. So this was yeah. actually something that was in one of the Tim Web posts was late was actually Mortis in particular was accused of being over the, the weight limit by a few unknown users which was heavily um dis- which was heavily um which was heavily denied by one of the members, I believe Arthur Chilcott. So again, as said so the fact that many of the machines were overweight, yet Hefty had to re- remove its self-writing mechanism, clearly played an impact on why the team was so upset. Additionally, that wasn't the only reason why Hefty was compromised, because we should talk about CO2 again. As said, Hefty's pneumatic system required refilling every two hours, but the team was forced to queue up the entire afternoon to wait for their match which I believe was a problem because I said they couldn't be because they had to queue up for the entire afternoon they were unable to refill the pneumatic system which was difficult to do so it might have been linked to the fact that Rex Garrard's Cassius 2 was affected by its lack of CO2 it's possible yeah potentially again it's one of those extra layers of uh, potential problematic situations isn't it and uh, sadly, in Hefty's case, uh, everything seemed to uh, snowball against it in Series yeah. 3. So, so essentially, a pneumatic system with a lack of CO2 and a shroomek that had to be removed. I personally don't think... <laughs> Not ideal. Hef- <laughs> I, d- I personally don't think Hefty would have beaten Exterminator anyway, but... No, as of said, course, but... Brown does raise a good point that mental arguably did not care about making the competition fair because as I said the weight limit issues the CO2 issues yes Exterminator may have won cleanly but let's face it the team could have been happier the hefty team could have been happier had Mentorn actually gave a damn but ultimately well, it, it definitely seemed like hefty was at a certain disadvantage yeah for sure yes yes absolutely not uh, not to say it would have won but it wasn't uh, exactly seemingly allowed to perform at the potential it could no, have no and that's why ultimately brown and his fellow team member stuart reynolds left the arena disgruntled after sir Killalot dumped hefty down the pier according to gearheads yes. according to gearheads apparently the team were upset that their robot was destroyed or something like that I think it might have been just the well, book going over the top I was about top, to but... say that um, yeah. yeah I was about to say that uh, Hefty suffered some pretty uh, hefty shall we say track damage in the <laughs> aftermath of it being uh, immobilised yeah. yes said so and the fact that it already cost a few thousand pounds again house robot, t- house robot damage again and no wonder the team were upset so, as I said, definitely one of the bigger controversies that honestly didn't actually make the headlines at the time. No, because it's a more isolated incident for a single robot, but it's not ideal, no. no. And were it not for gearheads, we probably wouldn't even know that this controversy occurred in the first place. But, one controversy that did take place was of course Cassius 2 versus Pussycat now again a lot of you may be a bit confused by this how is Cassius 2 versus Pussycat controversial you may ask well the official narrative was that Cassius 2 reversed too quickly and didn't take any care with making sure that Pussycat was you know being pushed behind them which was ultimately why Pussycat dodged the attack and Cassius 2 fell awkwardly into the pit but as it turns out, this battle may have been rigged without Team Cold Fusion even realising it. So, according to the East Anglian Daily Times, in their article on Rex Garrod retiring, Rex Garrod was so concerned about the health and safety issues that were taking place throughout filming, that he just ultimately threw away the match and left as soon as possible. Now... 
I was trying to figure out how we could have thrown that battle, and then I realised there is actually a very good way he could have done so, because similar to the way that Mortis lost against Panic Attack, there was a change of driver, and as a result, we had the less experienced Mick Cutter driving Cassius II during that battle. So it could be argued that he didn't throw it away as in deliberately driving into the pit as I originally suspected, but instead decided not to give a damn for the rest of the show and just let Mick Cutter try his best at driving this incredible machine. Alas, he was probably quite happy that Mick Cutter ultimately drove Cassius II into the pit because by then, as he says in his own words, he was not happy at all which is quite a shame. This also may explain, because of the fact that he just it just says he promptly left filming straight afterwards, that why Cassius II didn't even compete in the International League Championship, because I assumed that this was took place after the filming for the main series. So, yeah. Yeah, certainly. It's, that's definitely been, as you say, one of the more... Um highlighted things about series three and uh it is rex definitely um always came across as a guy who cared utmost about safety and standards and he seemed to have like a low tolerance if people's healths were uh in danger so it's certainly uh something that you could understand him being very unhappy with especially as we discussed last episode, for how long it had been going on for up until this point in time. So yes, I have to admit, I was quite upset when I heard about the the revelation of Cassius II just ultimately throwing the battle like that, because, as I said, it changes the narrative quite a lot, because at the time we all thought that, wow, Pussycat had done a tremendous dodging effort by arguably one of the best drivers in David Gribble and now the new narrative is that yes Pussycat did a, a brilliant move but ultimately the battle is kind of tainted in a way that Cassius 2 didn't have its main driver and the team were demoralised etc etc and it kind of kills the whole thing really the fact that Rex Goward decided to throw the battle so I can understand why he did it but as said, it doesn't make, it didn't make series three any better as a result. So, yeah, it's just one of those things that sadly ended up happening because of all of the combination of circumstances, really, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, and that wasn't the only controversial fight starring Pussycat. Meanwhile, because. And this is definitely one of the <laughs> most notable con controversies on the show because it was actually featured. As we know, Pussycat beat Scutter's Revenge only to be told, no, you didn't beat Scutter's Revenge. You've been disqualified for from the show for the Shattered Disc incident. So, based on the narrative from Jonathan Pierce, it, it was believed that Pussycat's team had deliberately inserted a hardened steel blade that just broke apart, shattered apart upon impact with the wall, which was clearly a health and safety risk, etc, etc. The team were naughty, they were disqualified, and Scott's revenge got through very luckily, <laughs> as I said, in a very, in a good, um, yes, in a good piece of good fortune. But, based on the comments surrounding two of Pussycat's team members, the narrative isn't quite what the show would have you to believe. So, there was a break in filming after Pussycat's win over Cassius 2, and the team were kind of dissatisfied with the current blade they had for their machine, because let's face it, it wasn't quite like the Series 4 blade that we all came to know and respect. This was a blade that quite frankly didn't cause that much damage and the team were all yeah, mainly it, on... Yeah, it was, it was just circular as such, yeah. Yeah, how well the machine was controlled. So they decided, you know what? Why don't we change the disc? Once the team, minus Alan Gribble, returned to filming, 
they informed the technical crew of the change, according to Robin Hedwig. And this was a new blade, the hardened steel blade that we got to see. So, immediately, this raises a, bit, a few questions. Why was it that the technical crew allowed Pussycat to enter the arena with a clearly illegal blade? And why is it that the producers decided to throw Pussycat's team under the bridge like that? Similar to how they threw Mortis under the bridge when during the whole pinball fiasco in Series 2. And it should also be mentioned that as much as it was a health and safety risk, Alan Gribble, as he mentions in his interview with another Robot Wars Wiki user, to Ganondorf, that the decision was harsh because not only did the blade not actually harm anyone as a result, Pussycat didn't actually gain any competitive advantage using it, yet won the match fair and square again because Scutter's Revenge suffered technical issues. And we should also mention just how many times a machine did something unsafe. I mean, four series later we got to see Typhoon 2 obliterate the arena wall, making it unsafe, to gravity, flipping Hydra around, yeah, in, and destroying the arena wall and camera. As much as the decision to equip Pussycat's Blade was kind of silly, I actually do have a lot of sympathy for Team Cold Fusion, if this narrative is true, because, as said, they were given permission to actually use the blade, it shattered, they were still given permission, so it should have been the responsibility of the crew, the, produ the production crew. The team didn't give any uh, competitive advantage using it, they didn't, weren't able to actually effectively use it to damage Scutter's Revenge. Scutter's Revenge broke down, so Pussycat won fairly. And honestly, as said, no one was harmed by it. So, as said, a very controversial incident, and it does make me wonder whether we actually missed out on seeing some really good Pussycat performances later on. I mean, imagine Pussycat vs. 101, for example. That would have been quite an interesting match. Yeah, I mean, Pussycat in that bracket in the semi-finals in general would have just made it much more open and interesting because ultimately Scutter's Revenge had issues again. Yeah, I said that Scutter's Revenge vs. 101 battle wasn't great compared to some of the other matches we saw in that episode. I honestly think Pussycat vs. 101 would have been a hell of a match, and I honestly think Pussycat could have won that one, personally. I mean, we can always debate this, we're not going to debate it here, obviously, but as I said, <laughs> I, I, by default I would argue that it would have been a better battle, but alas, never happened, and never will. So, sadly again, one of those things that... Uh came as a consequence of all of the things that stacked on top of each other, really. Yeah. So, moving on to Heat N, another controversy that was actually uh, mentioned on TV, the whole Griffon versus Daisy Chopper match. So, mm -hmm. this is an example of why you shouldn't believe everything you see on TV, as actually mentioned in an interview I conducted with Oliver Steeples back in 2018. So, to discuss the battle, Griffon seemingly won, and by a judge's decision, and Daisy Chopper's team were absolutely furious with this, and decided that there needed to be a recount straight away. And, for some reason, for a lot of people's confusion, especially for many viewers who didn't know the full story, one of the judges actually changed their vote towards Daisy Chopper, which of course wasn't enough for Daisy Chopper to win, but still is something that should be noted as odd, to say the least. So, the reason for why Daisy Chopper's team requested a recount was because they felt that Griffon's lapses in control, combined with what they felt were better attacks from their machine, meant that Daisy Chopper should have won. On his website, Oliver Steeples, and this was in 2000, ultimately agreed with Daisy Chopper's team, believing that his decision to go after the house robots, combined with greater aggression from the spinner, should have warranted a win for Daisy Chopper. This is perhaps... There is actually evidence from another battle that suggests that 
Daisy Chopper might well have actually deserved a win because as mentioned these battles are edited beyond belief I mean to show if you want to see a battle in its unedited form go on YouTube and search up Stig 2 vs Iron Ore for example that battle in its unedited form is actually quite a train wreck <laughs> to be quite honest and <laughs> in the edited version they made it look like Stig 2 and Iron Ore were doing much more than they were actually capable of doing you know with the whole Stig 2 flipping over Matilda etc etc but in the actual unedited form Stig 2 was struggling to actually flip Iron Ore for the most part and Iron Ore was struggling to do virtually anything but back in series 3 there's also another example that should warrant a discussion point Corporal Punishment versus Alligator again why was it that the judge's decision ended in 2-1 to Alligator I mean surely Alligator based on what we saw easy dominated that fight right well in arguably one of the biggest cases of poor editing on the show it turns out that corporal punishment actually did a lot more than it what transpired according to a discussion with peter duncanson and adam clark corporal punishment actually got back onto its wheels following it being overturned by sir kill a lot thus being able to push alligator around somewhat which may justify the split decision ultimately in favour of Alligator. So, rather than just saying that the Daisy Topper team were sore losers, etc, etc, do I do actually have a bit of empathy for them, because from what we understand, there might have been more footage that suggests that Daisy Chopper did a lot more than what it actually did against Griffon in the edited version. This is why I desperately want to get as many unedited battles as possible because as I said there are very few available out there aside from two Iron Ore matches in Series 4 and a few that were featured on the Ultimate the Warrior Ultimate collection, Warrior yes. yes. Because that may explain a number of judges' decisions that may have been controversial at the time but may actually be well justified if you saw the full battle. Yeah, I mean, especially in the classic series, we had fights that were five minutes in length, and yet even for some judges' decisions, we could sometimes only see a minute 30 of the battle in the edit, so we did lo lose a lot on the cutting room. I mean, a portion of that is always going to be dead air, but at the same time, there's going to be little attacks, little moments that are deemed not necessarily entertaining enough for TV, but would potentially be decisive in a Robot Wars judge's decision, for example. Yeah, so yes, um, that may explain some of the most controversial decisions of all time. For example, Moot against Judge Shred for example, in Series 7, where apparently Moot got a lot more attacks in than what we actually saw, because the edited version decided to concentrate on Moot's inability to properly self-write <laughs> yeah again the, the entertaining visual side of things for the tv audience rather than necessarily what would be deemed the most balanced and fair edit for a judge's decision yeah so overall then we've seen a number of controversies in battles including the overuse of house robots a battle possibly being rigged, health and safety issues, and a few questionable judges' decisions. But there was actually one battle that wasn't didn't even take place because of health and safety issues that we should now talk about. So we have to go all the way to the end of filming, which was for the first world championship. Some people debate whether or not this counts as series three, but I'm gonna include it anyway because I feel it is close enough to to series three to warrant discussion. So, as many of you all know, Mauler was meant to take uh, was meant to take a stand against Cerberus in the first, in the in the first one battle. However, 
because of the various health and safety issues that plagued filming of course you know the accidents etc etc they wanted the producers wanted Mauler's weapon to be tested before the um, battle could take place notably there is an image and video of the battle of the test taking place which clearly shows it was taken outside the reason for this was because there was a lack of testing arena according to the Sting team and as you can see as well that explains the unfortunate circumstances that Miss Strutt's team member had when they were trying to refuel their machine I think it, sorry um, just trying to think of his name what was it called what was he called uh, as ah here we go so uh, there was actually a lack of testing arena for Mulder to conduct a safety test because, according to the Sting team, which is why it took place out in the open in a rainy day, as mentioned by Ian Inglis of the Mistruts team, who, as we mentioned in the earlier episode, had a few calamities when refueling the machine during, let's say, a rainy day. <laughs> So, <laughs> yes. <laughs> but whether or not the testing of the weapon being activated is considered a safety issue or not, Mulder was deemed too dangerous for the arena and was disqualified before the battle could even begin. And honestly, it's not really the whole bit of, you know, you've been disqualified because of the health and safety issue. Yeah. It's more due to the fact that they brought the team over from America to just be told yes. you can't compete. That really sucks, in my opinion. Yeah. It, no, absolutely. It's um, it's uh, a shame enough if you travel up the country a little bit and then you have your hopes dashed, but to travel across all the way from there and then essentially just be let down by not enough planning, not enough coverage in general on what uh, they expected the arena could take, it's... Again, I, I'll always be willing to uh, err on the side of caution when accusing people or things of being uh, ill-judged or wrong, but this just felt very erroneous and, <laughs> and, and uncaring, essentially. Yeah, and to be honest, it is quite possible that Mauler's team were arguably the most messed around team by the was arguably the team that was fucked around most of all throughout Robot Wars because mm -hmm. I wasn't going to talk about this because technically this doesn't count as a series 3 controversy because it's the MTV pilot but you know what because we've already talked about the problems Mauler had with his first world championship battle let's talk about the other Mauler controversy that took place during filming for the MTV pilot because this just shows just how poorly um, things were going around for this team. So, for those who are unaware, the MTV pilot was filmed by was filmed to determine whether MTV would pick up the show. Ultimately, TNN would because MTV elected not to, and. Mauler actually won the event. They beat machines such as the Mangulator and even got revenge on Frenzy. Unfortunately, uh, this actually does frustrate me more than most of the controversies we've actually discussed for Series 3, but um, before the MTV pilot was filmed, one of the team members for Mauler, Morgan Tilford, stated that, look, I've got a few exams for that are upcoming that are going to occur a week after the pilot's filming. I need you to give me a direct return flight to California. Mentor agreed and they negotiated a travel deal with Continental Airlines and helping which would which would help both sides mutually because yes it would help the Mauler's team return home from Glasgow to San Jose but would also ensure that Mentor met the low budget constraints as well. But yeah. after the team left following their win in the MTV pilot, 
they discovered that the airport was shut and it turns out that the coordinators had made a mistake in booking flights for most teams. All Mentor could provide was a flight to Newark, which would not take place until a couple of days later. And as a result, Tilford would actually miss some of his exams. And as I said, this just angers me so greatly because I don't know. Oh, I, yeah. I don't understand I mean, why. Obviously, he's going to want to be part of a exciting event. But he also needs to cover stuff that's happening back home as well, so it shouldn't have been as difficult as it was. No. Yeah, I'll be honest, Nick. It's not a funny story because it actually led to a chain of events that would actually cause Tilford to experience a mental health breakdown and even become sectioned for a while. So I won't discuss any more about it because I said it's a a truly no. tragic story but um, if you want if people want to read a bit more onto this i suggest getting the gearheads book for more details on that but as i said i honestly believe that the mauler team were definitely the most messed around team in all of robot wars because they were sent to uk where they were told they couldn't compete and then all of a sudden were able to compete and then were messed around on the return flight back to America. So, ah, just... It's, no wonder the team didn't compete in Extreme Warriors afterwards. Yeah, I mean, it was bad enough that the first incident occurred, wasn't it? So Yeah. So, yeah. To happen again into an even more extreme standard, just says quite a lot so with all that said and done series 3 and one controversy that technically didn't take place in series 3 but whatever a number of changes had to be made for series 4 that ultimately helped make series 4 and beyond a much better experience for roboteers and production crew alike so yeah start with a ton of health and safety changes were made particularly at one point fail safes became mandatory during series 4 i believe based on the discussion on facebook recently regarding when fail safes became mandatory um and it's even detailed in the Ex robot wars extreme official guide stating that a fail safe must be inserted at all times Another change dictated how robots were to enter the arena because rather than have the robots be carried into the arena by their teams they were instead placed in a pen, switched on and finally driven into the arena thus negating the need to have roboteers enter the arena and limiting the time they were forced to interact with their active machines. I mean, I just love how they did it in series from Extreme 1 onwards just seeing the machines enter that way. Yeah. yeah. So, and honestly, one of the most notable things was is that health and safety procedures in general just became strict, and any roboteer that did not comply was given harsh criticism. Harsh but fair, I would argue. So, I'll bring an example up. We should talk about the robot called Scorpizoid. Have I pronounced that correctly? Uh, yep. Yeah, Scorpizoid which was a machine that attempted to qualify for Series 7 and it was equipped with a couple of cutting blades but the team had forgotten to bring the means of covering those cutting blades up when the robot was not in active combat and so they resorted to cutting plastic bottles and covering them up that way. The production crew were not pleased to say the least and stated that if the team were to qualify <laughs> yeah. for the wars they needed to have better means of covering the blades in the future. At the time when I first read this back when the Scorpizoid article was made on the Robot Wars wiki I actually thought this was a bit harsh you know again roboteers are only human etc etc but as we saw from the various series 3 catastrophes these criticisms have merit now that We've documented all these health and safety issues. Any lapse in standards yeah, and sure. disaster could strike once more. So, not worth the risk. Uh, yep. 
absolutely i mean even to this day you still get a ton people still get a ton of criticism for any mistake they make regarding health and safety i mean the frostbite team with their very unsafe safety tests and there was even a sh robot combat show in india i believe where there wasn't any protection at all for the audience which was absolutely yes. torn to pieces by many people viewing it so and series 3 arguably started that strict trend towards health and safety so if there's one positive we can get out of this is that the third wars definitely ensured that a people were protected and b that lapses in standards would always be closed as soon as possible yeah definitely frustrating that it had to take something big to make progress but at least at the very least at least there wasn't a continuation of being in denial or anything like that there were yeah. slow movements in the right direction yeah and as mentioned it it was argued that perhaps the steering committee, which was a selection of roboteers that actually helped the show's producers during the early series, definitely helped matters drastically. Because you've got, all of a sudden, you've got people such as Simon Harrison, uh, Ian Inglis, George Francis, as well as some technical crew members such as Derek Foxwell, who knew what they were doing. And who knew yeah. how to ensure that these that future series would be improved? And there was even a meeting, I believe, on February the eleventh, twenty twenty, February the eleventh, two thousand, which discussed feedback on Robot Wars: The Third Wars. We don't know too much about what transpired about this feedback, but let's face it: the safety and organisation for Series Four definitely improved. And to be honest. I can just say from top to bottom that Series 4 just looked a heck of a lot more professional, both in terms of the arena presentation, to the fact that the pinball carried on throughout the entire of the series from ATP, etc, etc. It just felt complete, which was something that Series 3 didn't really have as a result of the safety issues. Yeah. Yeah. And I should also mention as well, we mentioned a few safety changes that benefited the Roboteers and Production crew. The audience as well were protected quite nicely from the carnage later on. The Series 4 arena definitely looked a heck of a lot more safer as, as a result of the whole thing, which I believe had a polycarbonate cage surrounding it so that, yes, people could easily see through it and watch the battle as it took place but also ensured that no debris was going to hit them no matter what so again another good benefit well, yeah exactly we, we had we had an actual like a box as such and we didn't have any uh cherry pickers either we no had cherry uh, pickers either control yes booths that were <laughs> yes we had control booths yeah. that were actually in place and there to go so yeah, it, it was obviously a big job to get that arena done, but it's it's good that it happened so immediately after some of those really big issues that happened in Series 3. Absolutely, yes. It, it was an immediate statement of trying to move in the right direction as such. Hmm, indeed. But ultimately, as we know, the whole the many, many changes that occurred was not enough to keep Rex Garrard f keep Rex no. Garrard for future series because according to the East Anglian Daily Times article as well as a Tectonic Robot Wars UK interview Rex Garrard simply had enough of the whole fiasco that was taking place and it is argued that Rex Garrard wasn't really a fan of the direction this series, the show was taking either because as a result of the gauntlet and trials being removed, he argued that the fighting element was being overly focused on, which he felt that was deviating too much from the primary message of what the show was meant to teach children, what the primary message was about, which was to teach children about robotics, obviously. 
And simply yeah. put, he just wasn't interested anymore. But as much as I can understand that viewpoint, we should mention though that Mentor had tremendous success with Robo Wars following series three. I mean, there is a there's a Guardian article in two thousand and two which details just how successful Robo Wars was becoming in America, Germany, Sweden and was even getting to the point where the show was absolutely downright beating BattleBots, Robotica and any other competition and was even in line for new toys as well and even an animated series. When you've got even an animated series being planned then you know you're doing something well with the (laughs) main show. So Imagine that. Yeah. (laughs) So I still think though that yes Rex Goward I can understand Rex Goward would draw him, but quite frankly, had he given it another chance, I think he would have personally been okay with the show. Yeah, I mean, he he did end up being one of the people who tried to push for higher safety standards from the very off, so you can't blame him for um, feeling how he felt, but at least he did end up making that stride towards change uh, through his own beliefs and uh he took the stand he believed was in his own interest so yeah so let's finish off then with perhaps a bit more of a light-hearted story so we should talk again about Roger Plant who as we mentioned previously suffered a bit as a result of his machine the big cheese enduring damaging enjoying significant damage that was costly and time consuming to repair in his rant on Tim Webb he decided to build an all out powerful titanium machine which of course turned out to be really big cheese so (laughs) and not too bad but as he was building really big cheese there's actually another Tim Webb post that details a very interesting challenge he pitted against the house robot Sekilla lot. He wanted an unchanged Sekilla lot against a mostly unchanged Big Cheese, which was slightly overweight than usual because of the repairs that had to take place, in a fair one on one match. It's a shame that this challenge didn't actually happen because, quite frankly, this seems like the catalyst for a brilliant um, house robot rebellion, quite frankly. But Yeah, I was going to say either that or as a main event in a Vengeance episode. <laughs> yes, but at least we did get to see some battle involving Roger Plant versus Sekiro Lot. Because of course, in Really Big Cheese's yeah. first battle in on um, Robot Wars, Really Big Cheese went under and tried to flip Sekiro Lot. Ultimately, Really Big Cheese failed and the melee turned into a very entertaining but dominating battle for the house robots to win, quite frankly. And really, <laughs> the real winners in that was not Real Big Cheese, was not Prize Fighter, was not Rido Source, were not even the house robots, but of course, it was the fans, because this was definitely yes, one of the it was, most... It was an entertaining mess, yeah. Yes, that was definitely one of the most entertaining things I've seen on Robot Wars, let alone battles. Still, I think this is a great place to end things with an entertaining battle to end things on how fitting for a show called robot wars <laughs> so yes so this has taken us a few hours to film and stuff and uh yes we've been through a lot as i said from the health and safety issues to the organizational flaws the controversial battles but in the end Things just got better and better for Robot Wars and I am forever grateful that the show finally got through its teething problems from Series 3 and became the powerhouse that it eventually would become from Series 4 onwards. For sure. Yeah, very very well summed up and uh, it's been a very, um, very interesting couple of hours in general that we've had with these uh, episodes and this little mini series as a spin-off to the robot wars history podcast and uh i'm sure if we 
think of other subjects to go into, you'll be there once again to help us cover it. Yeah, well, I hate to be one to, you know, um, try to insert myself into a future podcast, but believe it or not, there is actually a bit more interesting information, not controversial, not involving controversies, but instead some things that might be interesting to the hardcore Robot Wars fan about how Series 3 was filmed and including some tag teams that never were to super heavyweights that were set to compete and as well as a very interesting stance towards how international competitions would be filmed. So definitely yeah. got a lot more to perhaps tell about in a future podcast. <laughs> sorry to yeah, sorry to try and bring myself don't, into it. <laughs> don't yeah. don't worry, all you guys listening. If um if you uh think we'll run out of things to discuss, you would be uh very much in the wrong there. We'll always have some form of content, I'm sure. But yeah. once again, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> thank you, uh, Space Maniac, for joining. This has been yeah, yeah. a really um, really interesting, different change of pace, and um, hopefully we'll uh. Yeah have something to go again soon yeah thank you very much Nick for letting me essentially talk about this for several hours it's been absolutely a real interesting ride throughout <laughs> the past two years being able to essentially research this whole thing and I welcome anyone Roboteer fan alike to discuss these things and point out any inconsistencies that we may have discussed because there was actually s oh absolutely yeah, absolutely yes so i look forward to reading the comments both on facebook and on youtube and try to keep it civil just just point it out yeah <laughs> yeah for sure so you guys still listening always feel free to uh put in your own opinions or even things you might have uh, ended up finding out that we might not even know but um Nevertheless, this has been really good stuff, and uh, we'll see what we'll come back with in the future. So, I have been NJGW with Space Maniac from the Robot Wars Wiki, and thank you guys for watching. See you next time. <laughs>